All right, <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and get started now. Yeah. So uh, my name is Jerry Garul, uh, accounting manager here at the city of Richmond, and I manage over the budget division and treasury division. And tonight, this evening, we have the community budget meeting today, um, where we have staff in the audience for questions, and we're gonna talk about the development of the budget process. Um, so to kick things off, we have Nikki Maste, the deputy city manager of internal services for you. Thank you, Jerry. So tonight we'll be going over our community budget meeting. Next slide. As you can see, we will be discussing the purpose of the budget, financial highlights, the budget goals, the budget process, general fund revenue and expenditures, non-general fund revenue and expenditures, ARPA and other grants, a traffic calming program, and then we'll close. Next slide, please. Here is our org chart. Sorry about the size. In general, the city council, they have three direct reports. That would be the city manager, the city attorney, and the city clerk. And all department heads roll on up into the city manager. Next slide, please. I will now introduce Andrea Miller, our director of finance. Good early evening. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All righty. I'm going to touch a little bit on the purpose of the budget. The budget primarily focuses on four key areas. Um, it's a policy document, so we do include a snapshot of the city's um, financial policies within the document. It's also a communications device. Um, you can rely on our budget document for wealth information about the city as a whole, as well as the uh, financial uh, policies and the budget that has been adopted by our city council. It's an operations guide. We utilize it on a day-to-day -day basis as a tool to rely on for funds that have been programmed for various projects and programs. And it's a financial plan. So it includes long-term financial forecasting as well as the annual adopted budget for the year. Next slide, please. Some financial highlights for the current fiscal year. Um, one is, is a really great one. We improved the city's uh, Richmond's Moody's credit rating to A2. And the purpose of having a good credit rating is that it allows us to borrow, um, uh, issue debt and borrow on a, at a lower rate, um, a better interest rate. So that's really good. Also, our general funds balance. We've increased the unassigned general fund balance or reserve to 21%. Um, we started the fiscal year with a balanced adopted budget, which is great news. Uh, revenues should equal to or exceed your, um, your expenditures rather should equal to or exceed your revenue. So the, ba the budget is a balanced. Um, in terms of grants, the city currently has over $204 million in grants, which is great. Um, and so we are making sure we effectively manage those for the programs in which they're intended. Um, we pre-funded, um, we've established pre-funding policies for our pension and our other post-employment benefits, or OPEB. We often refer to it by its acronym. Um, so we are pre-funding those to reduce our um, unfunded liability. And then uh, the last accomplishment is relates to our state corrective action plan, which is in process. There were um, 11 findings for the state audit, and we've now completed um, 10 of the 11. Next slide, please. Um, I won't read all of this. There's a lot of information there, but we've accomplished many things that I've already stated, um, which includes our balanced, adopted balanced buds, budget and the improvement of our uh, cash reserves of 21%. Um, we've initiated several key capital projects, one of which is the main library. We've uh, started on that, as well as improvements to the Booker T. Anderson community. Thank you. <laughs> uh, as well as uh, improvements to our Booker T. Anderson Community Center. Um, historically low homicide rates in the city, at, um, there were eight in the prior calendar year. Um, as well as improving our businesses at the port area, with, uh, we've solicited uh, Moxion was recruited to the port to help improve um, our green, blue, new jobs in our community. Um, we are in the process of establishing a community crisis response program. Uh, as well as securing $8.6 in encampment resolution funding, that's round two. Uh, to help with our uh, unhoused population. Uh, served uh, 749 youth by providing um, career counseling as well as uh, academic uh, career advisement. Um, improved our library hour or increased our library hours by reinstating the Saturday hours. <laughs> 
And um, the last thing we'll touch on is a Long Star After School program uh, by uh, including the after school homework help programs at all three of our library locations and two community centers. Next slide, please. For the fiscal year 2024-25 budget goals, um, as always, a, we start off with a structurally balanced budget. Um, we're evaluating the service levels across all departments, um, maintain those improved bond ratings, as well as investing in the city's built environment and facilities. And last, uh, to emphasize on maintaining that being fiscally sustainable and establishing those policies to make sure we ensure fiscal sustainability across all programs. Next slide, please. In terms of the budget process, um, budgets are initially developed with input from all departments. And I'll go a little bit more into the uh, key dates in our plan, but we include input from all key departments. We review that input, make revisions through a series of internal and public meetings, such as this one. Um, we receive uh, community feedback through engagement, and this evening's um, engage, community engagement process is the third um, and final in our for this fiscal year. And then finally, the city council makes final decisions regarding the budget allocations. Next slide, please. Some of those key dates, we kicked off our budget with a training and a kickoff in January of this year. All departments had a two-week window to input their budget, um, the end of January through uh, February. Um, finance department, along with the city manager's office and all departments, held a series of budget hearings during uh, March. We like to call it March Madness, being themes. It is kind of mad, but yeah, we <laughs> meet to get input on those budget um, requests. Um, we also um, met with the unions last in uh, March. Uh, as, as I've already stated, we have a series of community budget meetings. So we had two last week on the 8th and the 11th, and tonight's is our third meeting to receive that input from our community. It's not only in person, but also online. Um, we uh, will submit our first draft of the budget to City Council on the 7th of May, um, and we'll do a full uh, budget session on the 28th of May. Uh, that time, we also develop our budget checklist with input from the City Council, and we gather all that information together and report back at the June meetings with an anticipated goal of having an adopted uh, 2024 25 operating and CIP budget. And for the, if I didn't clarify that already, CIP is our capital improvement plan budget approved by council on the 18th of June. And with that, I will turn it over to Antonio. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, Antonio Bagnolos, Finance Dep uh, Department Accounting Manager over the Revenue Division. So this chart uh, is a uh, the mid-year revenues for 23-24. Uh, total revenues at this point is uh, budgeted at $234 million. Currently, the top three revenue streams account to about 72% of the general fund revenue. So that's uh, property taxes, sales tax, and utility user tax. This share has actually gone down in the last few years. It used to be closer to 80%. Doesn't mean that these revenues have gone down. It means that other revenues outside of these top three have actually increased uh, a little bit more significantly. Uh, the main drivers have been a couple of voter-approved items, including um, Measure U uh, in, the, in the license, permits, and fees categories. That was approved by the voters in 2020. And that revenue stream has gone from $3 million a few years ago to $13 million we budgeted this year. Also, Measure H uh, was approved by the voters in 2018. That changed the rate structure for the documentary transfer tax on sales of properties in Richmond. Uh, before Measure H, that revenue stream was usually five to six million dollars. Uh, although it's a very volatile, volatile stream, uh, we have seen some years be as high as twenty million dollars. Actually, a couple of years back, that revenue was around twenty million dollars. Okay. For the next few slides, I'll focus on the on these top three revenue streams. You know where this revenue comes from, who pays it, and you know, how we get it. Next slide, please. Okay. Here, property taxes. Um, So for the county collects this for the city of Richmond. Uh, everybody sees a 1% on their property tax bill, but that 1% doesn't come to the city of Richmond. It's divided by, between the county, the city, and various agencies. As an example, if property is valued at 500000 the tax for that year would be $5,000. The school gets nearly half of this 1%. So if it's a $5,000 property tax bill, the school gets about $2,400. 
uh, the county and some other agents get the rest. And the city of Richmond roughly gets $1,400 of the, of the $5,000 property tax bill. So again, property taxes is, is a, an important revenue stream, but we do not get the full tax here in the city of Richmond. It's divided up uh, by the county for different agencies. Next slide, please. Okay, sales tax. Similar to property tax, it also gets divided up. Uh, currently, the sales tax rate in Richmond is 9.75%. Of that, only 2% comes back to the city of Richmond. Every city in the state gets a uh, 1% by default. That's called the Bradley Burns sales tax. Um, and cities that have approved uh, voter initiatives get additional revenues. In the city of Richmond, we have two half-cent vo uh, voter approved measures, Measure U, Measure Q, dating back seven, you know, many years, and we get additional money for that. Again, most of the money goes to different agencies. Uh, goes to the state, goes to, goes to BART, goes to regional items. Next slide. And finally, we have here utility user tax. Unlike property taxes and sales tax, 100% of this revenue comes to the city of Richmond. Uh, so anything that's paid for UUT comes back directly to the city of Richmond. We have different rates for the different types of uh, items, for example, telecommunications, your landlines, your cell phones, that's at 9.5%. Uh, prepaid wireless, uh, if you buy some you know, card at the store, that's 9%. Uh, video, 5% for, for cable. And gas, electricity, 10%. Uh, we, in this revenue category, we also have a, a tax settlement with Chevron where they're paying $4 million per year. That's actually about to run out, so that, that revenue stream is going away. Also paid by Chevron is what we call the cap provision, the max tax. Uh, this amount goes up or down every year based on a very specific CPI that's tied to the to energy services cost. Um, this year, the, that amount is $33 million. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Jerry. Thank you, Antonio. So the next few slides are going to be how the general fund spends its money. So the first slide we have today is the how the city spends its general fund revenues, which is $245 million for fiscal year 2023-24. Um, so how that breaks out by type is 35% uh, being personnel, salaries, and wages, 27% being personnel fringe benefits, 12% being transfers out, 15% being professional services and other operating, 2% being utilities, 8% cost pool, and 1% capital outlay with less than 0% of debt service. Next slide, please. So here we have the same information, just broken out by numbers. Um, so the general fund expenditures at the mid-year budget was $245 million, $107,435. Um, some of those higher categories, as we discussed, was the salary and wages at $85.9 million, payroll fringe benefits at $65.5 million. Then we have the professional and admin costs at $21.4 million. Um, and another high one is $21.5 million under cost pool. And then the rest of the categories are there, um, bringing up to the $245.1 million at mid-year. Next slide, please. The next pie chart we have for you today is the uses. So this is by function. So the same $245 million, um, but this is by function now. So 49% is for public safety, 15% for public works, 7% for community services, 7% for internal services programs, 3% uh, for general government, 1% for economic development, 1% for community development, and 17% for non-departmental, which includes that transfers out numbers. Next slide. Here we have a comparison, um, and this is comparing the original budget, the revised budget at the time, and the mid-year budget, um, and this is all uh, before the mid-year adoption, um, which was done in March. And so here you see the comparison um, between the three, the three bars, um, showing you know the high points, property tax being the highest, sales and use tax, and UUTs are the three big categories of revenues. Next slide, please. And this is the expenditure comparison, with the highs being the salary and wages, friend, payroll and fringe benefits, Operating transfers out coming at third, cost pool, and professional admin. Next slide, please. 
now we have the non-general fund revenues. Um, and this is for the fiscal year 2023-24 budget, and that is at $313 million. And non-general fund revenues consists of capital improvement funds at 26%, special revenue funds at 28%, other operation funds at 14%, <clears throat> debt service funds at 6%, enterprise funds at 13%, housing funds at 1%, and housing authority funds at 2%. Next slide, please. And the final one we have, the final pie chart we have is our non-general fund expenditure fiscal year 2023-24 budget. Same categories as before, um, which is by type, which is the capital improvement funds at 26%, special revenue funds at 26%, debt service funds at 4%, enterprise funds at 22%, other operation funds at 11%, internal service funds at 9%, and housing authority and housing funds both at 1%. And next slide, and I will kick it over to Mubeen Cotter, the Deputy Director of Finance. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, as Andrea mentioned in uh, one of the earlier slides that city has over $204 million in grants. So one of the major, uh, some of the major grants I'll be mentioning here, one of those is American Rescue Plan Act funding, which is allocated by the federal government to various, to several public agencies to mitigate the economic loss due to pandemic. And the city of Richmond got about $27.7 million from that funding. And the next slide shows uh, how those funds, $27.7 million, are allocated to various programs and projects. And uh, we have a little um, a caveat with this funding. All these funds will have to be obligated by the end of this calendar year, December 2024, 20, uh, and uh, expended by December 2026. So we are closely monitoring all these projects. And uh, if there is a project that doesn't you know, uh, uh, seem to be uh, uh, shovel ready or is slower in terms of their implementation, uh, these projects, these funds will be uh, diverted towards more shovel ready projects, which because the city doesn't really want to uh, uh, lose or return any of the, the, the dollars in this pot. The other uh, larger uh, grant is about $35 million, which is a Transformative Climate Communities Grant. Richmond received about $35 million from that program from state, and uh, that is to basically invest in the neighborhoods of Iron Triangle and Santa Fe and Coronado to improve uh, economic and uh, uh, climate-related improvements in those areas. And there are like various initiatives and programs uh, designed and curated to help with these funds. Some of those are uh, transit access and mobility, solar installation, energy efficiency, appliance electrification, water efficiency, urban greening and green infrastructure, health and well-being through parks and healthy foods. So there are, the next slide shows um, some more uh, exciting uh, projects or programs that are uh, funded by this $35 million. Uh, such as Neighborhood Complete Streets, Richmond Wellness Trail, e-bike landing library, and Resilient Homes, um, Basins of Relations, Bosque del Barrio, and ADA Accessible Garden, Orchard for All, Veggie RX, e-bike, share all these uh, programs and projects will be funded with this $35 million grant in these uh, mentioned earlier neighborhoods. Uh, we also have an environmental and community investment agreement with Chevron. Under that agreement, about 10 years ago, Chevron invested about $80 million uh, with the city and the various uh, uh, programs within the city. Of that, this, this uh, chart, this slide shows the major breakdown of those funds, how those will, those are being invested or uh, implemented in various programs, such as about $35 million was, uh, is invested in uh, Richmond Promise a Scholarship Program, where students uh, of the local uh, area uh, bound towards college get scholarships. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, we have competitive grant program for about $6 million, and then job training program about $6 million, public safety program about $2 million, free internet access $1 million, Transportation Transit Program, about $20 million. Climate Action Plan, about $1 million. Urban Forestry, $2 million. And Rooftop Solar and Energy Retrofit, about $6.2 million. So this is um, the, the recap of environmental 
and Community in Investment Agreement grant. Now, this slide actually talks about um, some of the, in this uh, a recent round of community engagement, uh, the city recognized that there is a lot of need and a lot of commentary about the traffic calming program, and there is a community has a lot of need in that area. So we would like to highlight this website that the city has developed for our citizens to uh, file uh, or, 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 or submit a request if there is uh, a need, they believe there is a need in their area, which is uh, uh, which can be implemented. So they can be uh, submitting those uh, requests using this website. So please go ahead and use this portal, and make yourself uh, heard and your uh, request be recognized formally. And uh, we also have received a lot of questions uh, via emails. I would like to invite our uh, staff analysts to read those email messages for record. Uh, first, I would like to invite Vernessia Ward uh, to read uh, first few, and then after that, Bert Jones. And after that, we'll have our Director of Finance facilitating the question and answer session. Thank you, Moving. Um, this comment comes from Alec Gwen Scott. Um, this dear city, thank you. Thank you. This comes from Alex Gwen, Alec Gwen Scott. It's dear city staff, Ms. Miller, and council member Jimenez. First, I want to thank you, thank you all for everything you do in Richmond. I know you folks have a lot on your plate, so thank you for even reading this. Second, I am writing a second time concerning traffic and pedestrian safety on Solano Avenue between San Pablo and Amador. I am a homeowner on, 700, on the 700 block of Ventura, and I hope that we can get some, some movement on safety improvements for both Solano Avenue and Ventura Street. My specific ask are speed bumps on the 700 block of Ventura Street between Clinton and Solano to stop or discourage cars from speeding up and down the street. High visibility crosswalks, new center line striping, and center line pedestrian safety signs on Solano at the intersection of, at a minimum, Solano and Ventura. Additional traffic calming and pedestrian safety access measures, especially at the intersections of Ventura and Solano and Humboldt, and Solano, including corner bump outs, extended red zone signage, and curb cuts. My reason for these requests are people speed on my block, Ventura Street between Clinton and Solano daily. This is a history, there is a history of tragedy here because of that. There, <clears throat> there are currently at least 10 children and several older and elderly residents residing on the block of Ventura Street between Clinton and Solano and even more if we count Ventura from Clinton to Garvin. We all like to walk the neighborhood. The neighborhood is zoned for Mira Vista School up the hill, so elementary kids have to cross these intersections to get to school. Same if we discuss access to Tiller or Alvarado Park. I don't feel safe with my children walking there. I have personally had close calls on both pedestrian and driver at my corner of Solano as well as Humboldt and Solano. The number of accidents I have seen at these intersections is excessive. Some of these have, quite, have been quite serious, including a fatality at the corner of Ventura and Solano several years ago. Crossing Solano, Ventura, or Humboldt at the intersections can feel like a real gamble due to speeding cars, improperly parked cars, poor street line, lighting lines, and on ramp to 80. Cars traveling at a high speed on Solano usually do not yield to pedestrians at the intersections and often try to go around other drivers that are turning or stopped at, the, at these intersections. Brass tax, um, we pay some of, if not the highest property tax in Contra Costa County. The point has all these measures at their most dangerous intersections. We would like some of these measures also. Anything you can do to address these problems is very much needed and would be greatly appreciated. I will try to attend the meeting this afternoon, but at least wanted to keep this message alive. Sorry for the long email. Thank you for your consideration. Alex Gwen Scott, and he lives on Ventura Street in Richmond. And we also have another uh, message from Ashley Whitaker. 
and it's to whom it may concern. I live on Amador Street in East Richmond Heights and walk along Solano to get to business on, Solano, on San Pablo. I would feel much safer if measures were taken to protect pedestrians from the busy car traffic. I'd like to express my support in making Solano more pedestrian friendly. I am urging you to approve the following. One is additional dedication within public works to execute the traffic calming request, the 18 unfinished and already approved in 2022 and our new project on Solano Avenue. And second, approve the fund, approve and fund the crosswalks on Solano project in the upcoming budget. They want light up crosswalks at each intersection, light up crosswalks at the freeway overpass, solar powered light up signage for pedestrians, roundabouts for each intersection, red painted curbs at the corner of each section to allow fire trucks to quickly move around the roundabouts. Kind regards, Ashley Whitaker. Thank you. Next, I have Bertram Jones. We'll read a couple more comments. Hello, this message is from the community, um, from Susan Whirl. She says, Dear City of Richmond, please help us stay safe when we walk in our neighborhood by installing high visibility crosswalks across Solano Avenue in the three and a half blocks between San Pablo Avenue and I-80. Daily, drivers think it is a raceway to the freeway. Crossing Solano Avenue is a necessary part of walking to parks, schools, groceries, and just taking a walk here. I have almost been hit while crossing Solano and after checking for traffic, an 85-year-old friend in my neighborhood told me she, was, she has come close to being hit several times. She said, I think they speed up when they see an older person. Kids on bikes, parents with strollers, folks of all ages need to cross the street safely. The freeway entrance does not start at San Pablo Avenue, but some drivers seem to think it does. We need crosswalks, signage, safety, please. This is about saving lives. Thank you. And this is from Susan Whirl on Lassen Street. And the next um, from the community, from Shelly Trask, she writes, Hello, I'm writing to support the crosswalks on Solano community requests, as described below. Additional dedicated staff within Public Works to execute traffic calming requests, and it says the unfinished and already approved in 2022, and our new project on Solano Avenue. It also says approve and fund the crosswalk on Solano project in the upcoming budget. Light up the crosswalks at each intersection. Light up crosswalk at the freeway overpass. Solar powered line up signage, light up signage for pedestrians. Roundabouts at each intersection. Red painted curves at the corners of each intersection to allow fire trucks to quickly move around roundabouts. And the last, public safety needs to be an important neighborhood issue, as our neighborhoods are only as walkable as traffic allows. Please consider prioritizing walkability and safety for our neighborhoods. And this is from Shelley Trask on Key Boulevard in Richmond. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa and Bert, for reading those um, comments from the community into record. Um, we have, um, and thank you all for attending both in person and online. We have a mic uh, available. If there are any other uh, members of the community uh, who would like to speak, feel free to come to the mic. Um, actually, we've made the available the mic right there for um, community comment and questions. Well, I'll do my best here. Double-handed here. <laughs> uh, my name is Heather Bristow. 
I've lived in Richmond for 11 years. Um, this is my daughter, Beatrix Bristow. She's nine months old. Um, we can't cross the street on Solano Avenue safely where we live uh, between San Pablo Avenue and Highway 80. Um, we're in a kind of a, a particularly difficult area there um, it, on that stretch of Solano in that we're between a state highway, which is San Pablo Avenue is a state highway, and an interstate highway, um, Highway 80. And um, there is nothing in the between blocks whatsoever to cross or walk across um, Solano Avenue safely. So that's kind of the issue that why so many people are, are bringing this up. Um, so we're proposing a project. Um, obviously, we're not the ultimate decision makers on what happens, um, but I think what we're trying to get at with these, um, thank you, you, you can hold Beatrix. <laughs> um, what we're trying to get at here with, with these, this uh, project is that we really need kind of a lot of funding on this strip. Um, like one crosswalk really isn't gonna do it. Um, so, again, I'm not the decision maker, but we're throwing stuff out because we're a little bit desperate. I think people in walking the neighborhoods, we've understood that uh, people tried to do this 20 years ago. Um, neighbors are frustrated. There are neighbors talking about doing guerrilla efforts because we can't get anything done. Um, that's not to say public works isn't working hard, and I'll just say more about that in a minute. But um, So we're asking for red painted corners at each corner because our, our cars get parked up, and obviously if we're going to have crosswalks, we need that open. Uh, even as drivers, we have a hard time seeing around the cars. Um, we're asking for light up crosswalks because people go routinely 50, 60 miles an hour down this street. Um, and my own mother, who's 77, walking my nine-month-old, was almost hit. Um, I've been almost hit many times. It, you'll probably hear many people say that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, there are some really great roundabouts at Nevin at 33rd and 36th, um, where they're just drilled in really, really simple. Um, and if that's not possible on this road, we're looking for... Um, you know, just some strong efforts here, um, not just one crosswalk. We definitely need a way to cross the overpass. The, the freeway on-ramp is really, really, really dangerous. A car flipped there in November, knocked out the street light. The meter's been broken. There's an old sign from Public Works from a year ago that that work may be happening up until, I think it was July 2023. Um, it, it's kind of a forgotten area, and, and I'll just show you uh, I'll say that that really appreciate the work that um, that Public Works is doing. I think they're incredibly understaffed. Um, I think that was made really apparent at the last uh, city council meeting. Um, people have too many projects. It's public Public Works. They could speak to it better, but they have. Uh, and I see a couple of the hardworking people here <laughs> tonight. But they have something like 86, 89 giant projects to do, and then we have the um, 18 or so approved um, small traffic calming projects that were already approved in 2022, um, and and they're only able to get done about two of them. Uh, so basically what we're asking for tonight is not just for this project on Solano, but for Public Works to be given a lot more funding so that they can have more staff um, and specifically a dedicated group of people who will work on these small traffic calming programs that just fall through the cracks. Um, because otherwise, unfortunately, it just seems like it won't get done. And I think... Uh, we want to retain families, we want to retain people who are interested in their neighborhood, and um, if we can't deliver, it, it's hard to keep people around uh, in Richmond. Um, and I'll just show that, um, I want to mention that Department of Transportation on their own website says 40%, says high visibility crosswalks can reduce pedestrian injury crashes up to 40%. That would be uh, a fairly cheap, in the scope of things, way of really reducing um, harm. Um, I also just want to say um, that 
the McBride Safe Roads to Parks project, um, just in March, was slated for 2025-2026. Um, Claudia Jimenez came to our, our neighborhood council meeting and, and let us know that. So we were all really disappointed to learn that it had been moved to 2027-2028. We understand everything that Public Works is dealing with, uh, but it's still really disappointing. And I'll show you why. Um, but the reason is this really awesome CIP dashboard that Public Works made, uh, which is really handy, shows all the small traffic calming pro, uh, projects and larger scale projects, if I'm not correct. I, I, I'm not sure if this is exactly right. But what, what I'm seeing here is that this area uh, of East Richmond really doesn't have much going on in terms of projects. And that's, I live here between McBride, San Pablo Avenue, and the freeway. And that little area is really getting quite ignored in terms of um, f project funding. Uh, we tried to get crosswalks on Ventura, just like Alec has said, on Ventura between Solano and uh, Clinton 10 years ago, and it also fell through the cracks. Um, so we would like to see that happen as we're the, we're the only street, the only street in this 25 block radius that's up against a freeway or up against San Pablo or up against McBride that doesn't have uh, speed bumps. So it's a, it's a cut through. Um, anyway, I think it was pointed out to me in the last time I spoke here with Beatrix with me here who made an appearance that um, you know, people have been asking for these projects for 30 years, um, and Public Works has the job of trying to figure out how to go about listening to the public and getting these things done. And um, it was also pointed out to me that, you know, it needs to be equitable. And I would say, I think that's a really noble um, position to take. And, and I would agree that it should be equitable, that we don't really have much going on here in my little neighborhood. Um, the, the flats where I live there is full of blue collar folks. We have a lot of multi-generational families, um, a lot of people working multiple jobs just to pay a mortgage for one house. So um, yeah, and then if anybody uh, watching this wants more info and stay connected, it's <laughs> my email is richmondneighborheather at gmail.com. richmondneighborheather at gmail.com. Thank well, you. Thank you for those comments. Um, our public works director, Daniel Shavria, is present. He will talk to you further offline the comments um, that you uh, have provided previously, as well as this evening, have been forwarded to public works, and they will be in touch with you, as well as the other four um, comments that were read into record. At this time, we do have um, participants online. So Richard, are, is there anyone online who has any questions or comments at this time? Yes, hi everybody, thank you for joining us. All right, currently we have nine, 10 speakers. If you would like to say something, uh, all you have to do is press the raise hand on Zoom. And right now we're gonna get started with Gabriella Derrier. Please uh, hit unmute and ask your question. Hi, my, basically, um, I live on Clinton Avenue and this I'm talking about uh, in regards to the Solano crosswalk project as well. Uh, we're very concerned and uh, thank you for hearing us out tonight. Um, we just basically want to make this the for in the, you know, bring it to the forefront because we've been requesting something like this. Um, it's been going on to 10 years now that we um, we also wanted some uh, speed bumps, but that got pushed away. And um, I, be, I believe the city asked us if we could purchase them ourselves. So that went out the window. But, you know, it's a, it's very important. We don't want to see some, a, tra a tragedy happen. And then something happens and something then starts moving along. Um I appreciate what Heather said. She very much detailed everything that I wanted to mention. I'm not going to re repeat everything she said, but yes, we have to have some crosswalks uh, implemented there uh, on Solano Avenue or speed bumps, something to deter um, a tragedy to ha you know from happening. We last week, my husband and I went on a walk, and I had we both had a run across the street, a Solano because the cars do not slow, slow down. I mean, they know that there's no 
uh, crosswalk, so they don't care. And um, basically, that's what I wanted to mention and just um, piggyback on what Heather was saying and just, you know, bring to the forefront. Um, and I thank you for hearing us out tonight. Thank you, Gabriella. All right, our next uh, caller is Sue Bad Van Hattam. So uh, go ahead and ask your question right now. Press on mute. Um, I live on Solano Avenue. I've lived here for 23 years. And my son, when he was little, there was no way he could be in front of the house without holding my hand. Um, there was something that said, looks like you're done talking, which makes no sense. Okay, so I'm also here to request the cost crosswalks. It would be good to have them every block between San Pablo and 80. It would be fabulous if they were lighted. Um, before COVID, I used to walk to Catahoula every day. And uh, so I had to cross Solano every day. And my impression previously that was that cars in California were supposed to stop for pedestrians. But apparently that's only if there's a labeled crosswalk because they certainly don't stop. And I've had to wait and wait and wait some more sometimes. Um, and I've had two cats at different times killed on Solano. And I, to my son's great embarrassment, yell at cars, slow down. Um, I don't know how fast they're going, but it sure seems way too fast. So um, we see speeding cars every day. We see accidents multiple times every year. And I'm here also to request the crosswalks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. RK, our next um, Zoom caller is Kelsey Lynette. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello, my name is Kelsey Lynette. I live on Solano um, in the blocks we've been talking about, 5012 Solano Ave, just a block and a half up from San Pablo. I agree with all of the previous callers that traffic calming safety measures are long overdue on this stretch of Solano. Um, as Heather's graphics showed, there's a straightaway for about four blocks with no stop signs and no crosswalks and cars routinely drive well over the speed limit. And as previous callers have mentioned, do not stop for pedestrians. So much so that when I stop for pedestrians, they don't believe that I'm actually stopping because everyone in the neighborhood has been trained that cars don't stop. Uh, I have three young kids, ages nine, six, and three. Uh, the six and the three-year-old were born in this house and they've been raised, um, like Susan was saying, not to go outside in the front yard without holding onto somebody's hand because of the dangerous traffic conditions. Um, there, and this happens at all times of the day, especially when we're trying to get out to school, um, as people are also commuting to work, um, it happens in the evening, and it pretty much is a nonstop stream of cars. Um, a few years ago, there was a bunch of sideshows that were happening at San Pablo and Solano, and those sideshows spilled over um, onto Solano and the neighboring streets and there were cars doing dangerous stunts and driving unsafe speeds. Just last week, um, our van, my husband's a fisherman, um, and he has a van that he parked in front of our house. Uh, a hit and run driver crashed into it while parked. Um, so hard that the damage is over $10,000 to get it repaired. Um, so we currently are without a car while it's getting repaired. Um, I am just, you know, worried that more than property damage, there's going to be somebody that gets killed. And that's that's my biggest fear. I think everyone, as you've heard, who lives in this neighborhood knows it intimately because we live it every day, that it just feels dangerous. I've witnessed accidents. I've personally called in several different roadkill. Um, I'm sure there have probably been pets killed. Um, you know, this there's been a couple of incidents, um, including our trailer getting stolen in front of her house, which is maybe separate from safety. But I think it's because it's such an easy getaway. Um, the crime is easier to commit. Uh, but these few incidents that have happened just in the few weeks have made me think 
that we need to move to keep our families safe. So I fully support any and all traffic calming safety measures on Solano Ave. And I know that my neighbors who have lived here for 20 and 30 years have been living it daily their, their whole time here and would very much appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelsey. All right, our next caller is Rico Motorella. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you guys were able to hear me. We can hear you. Perfect, perfect, great, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I uh, happen to grow up in, in the area of uh, Solano, uh, in between, again, the blocks of uh, San Pablo and uh, I-80. Um, I moved there when I was 10 years old. I'm now 34. And uh, just uh, everything everyone's been saying, uh, car accidents, cars flying, uh, the lack of crosswalks, um, it sort of makes it so um, the people that live between McBride and Solano kind of have to stick within those streets to not have to cross Solano. Um, Kind of the same thing with like uh, uh, crossing McBride in a similar sense. Um, and uh, just wanted to support and, uh, you know, uh, just add on um, if, uh, you know, uh, more, more uh, safety measures could be added to the neighborhood. I think it would. Uh, uh, decrease, um, again, accidents and make people more, uh, com com uh, make people feel more safe to go outside and uh, walk. Uh, there's uh, people of all, all ages in the neighborhood, uh, a lot of elderly people, walking dogs, um, a lot of younger kids, um, and uh, yeah. Uh, it, it'd be real nice to see improvement um, in, in the area. Um, in, in my 20 years there, I think uh, the only thing I've seen um, are like the street lights to control uh, in, uh, uh, traffic going into I-80 in the area, um, but nothing regarding um, crosswalks or uh, the painted curves to uh, have it be more visible when, when you are trying to uh, access Solano, either in a car or crossing the street on foot. And uh, yep, yeah, uh, th thank you so much uh, for, for hearing uh, our, our concerns and uh, taking us into consideration. Thank you very much, Rico. All right, our next caller on Zoom is Julian Barbie. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hey there, yeah, my name's Julian Barb. I'm actually a neighbor of Heather's. I've been living on uh, Clinton Avenue for about seven years now. We, uh, we stroll the neighborhood quite a bit, almost daily. COVID, it was three, four times a day. Um, more recently, I've been trying to teach our little four, three-year-old to, to ride a bike. And so we're one, one block parallel to Solano, and that's pretty much the only direction we can take to, to walk more than one block. Um, so we're, we're constantly going that way, and it's just really a, a scary area. It's a scary street to cross. Um, there's blind spots everywhere, people flying by. Uh, the, the corners are blocked by trees, by cars being parked all the way to the edge. So really just kind of keeping this short, anything we can do to to make this area safer would be would be really appreciated by everyone in the neighborhood. All right, thank you very much, Julian, for calling. And okay, our next Zoom caller will be Rian A. Go ahead and ask your question after hitting unmute. Go ahead, Rian. Oh, okay, I can hear you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can okay, hear you. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I think just starting off, like I said, um, my name's Rian. I, I live in the 700 block, uh, pretty close to Heather and the Gwyn Scotts as well. Uh, first off, just want to express a lot of gratitude for giving us the time and the place here to give us some space to really express um, our grievances. Uh, I think tangenting along and adding to uh, many of the concerns regarding the the traffic calming project. Uh, you know, when I first moved here a couple of years back, I'm an avid jogger, um, really into love walking and taking breaks during the day to go for walks. And I loved seeing um, just the amount of foot traffic in this neighborhood. And I very quickly noticed that traffic, I mean, just as expressed earlier, is uh, tremendously fast um, down on Solano. And I have almost been hit uh, multiple times even after triple and even quadruple checking um, when I become paranoid enough before crossing the streets. I think that there, you know, there are ways to address this from um, the, the easy, medium, and more expensive pieces to try and slow down traffic. I think one of the easiest things that we can do is, is to um, really just set aside money for traffic circles, uh, stop signs, speed bumps, um, and also red line easements to increase visibility for people that are trying to make unprotected lefts and rights and for people who are also trying to cross. Um, like the previous speakers were saying, you know, when it comes to traffic uh, and right of way, we, we are generally taught that if we do not see a crosswalk or a yield or any type of bright signage that warns of pedestrians, we do not stop because we will generally have the right of way until we hit that pedestrian, of course. Um, it's gotten so bad to the point where I generally don't like to cross the street, and now I just drive to uh, the Wildcat Canyon Park to go on my runs there. Um, but I would really just love to be able to run or jog and walk through the rest of my neighborhood as well. Um, again, it's a wonderful neighborhood. I find it terrifying that this is the only section in the city that has this level of speed and traffic just because of the the geographic location of the highway there um and also i think with a lot this is a minor tangent but with a lot of the the sideshows and the um, individuals with with really loud cars that are doing donuts right off of the highway there um it would prevent and pretty much in my opinion stop that if there were some sort of speed bumps that would uh, really dissuade or um, disabuse them from doing that. Anyway, uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rian. All right, we have six more speakers. And just to let you know, the next set of speakers are Ian Cooper, John Worley, John Emery, Lisa B., and Anna Ferdinand. Ferdin all right, Ian Cooper, you're up next. Uh, ask your question to the finance staff. Hi, uh, my name is Shanna Rothman Cooper. I'm here on my husband's phone. Um, I also live, I live on the corner of Ventura and Solano. Um, and it is really unsafe to where it is hindering our quality of life. Um, I have a five-year-old who's never played in the front yard. I have a dog that's too afraid to go outside. I've had people's cars turning that corner on Ventura and Solano and spinning out and hitting our garage. Um, it's just, it's really hard for us as people who love this neighborhood, who are first time homeowners, who are really trying to like get a niche into the into the city to not feel safe uh, walking out our front door and to where I don't feel safe driving on onto Solano from Ventura because you can't see anything. Um, there's cars that are parked and there's oftentimes big oversized trucks that are parked that are blocking any kind of traffic coming off of the freeway and the traffic going onto the freeway. Um, I would also suggest putting in speed bumps um, on in between Ventura and like McBride um, that area there, that is also a racetrack, right? And we have a lot of people will get to, they'll turn on and they'll speed up just to get to Solano faster. Um, 
And so, like, yeah, this is a very walkable neighborhood. There's a lot of people walking around, a lot of animals, and a lot of families. Um, the population of children has gone up since I've moved in here, including my own child. Um, and so I just, I would love to see some, some actions taken to preserve um, quality of life, safety, um, and, like, retain people. Because if you can't feel safe here, if I can't feel safe here, I, I don't know how long I can stay here. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Our next speaker is John Worley. Go ahead, ask your question to the finance staff. Hi, this is John Worley. Um, I'm husband of Susan Worley. We live on Lassen Street. And I just wanted to say that I support the traffic calming plan on Solano Avenue, uh, whatever whatever it takes. Uh, I'm in, in my 80s and uh, actually walk those streets quite a bit and uh, I'm not as fast as I used to be. So, uh, you know, it would something that would, uh, you know, protect me and the younger uh, generation as well would be much appreciated. And that's really about all I have to say, thank you. Thank you very much, John. All right, our next caller is on Zoom, John Emery. Go ahead and press unmute and ask your question to the finance staff. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? We hear you. Okay, excellent. Uh, my name is John Emery. I live directly on Solano Avenue, 5209 Solano Avenue, between Humboldt and Ventura in that very first block by the 80. Um, and, uh, you know, the the speed of which people fly uh, through Solano Avenue to get onto that on-ramp for the 80 um, is not safe at all. I, I've just walking through the neighborhood, um, walking my dog, um, it, it's, it, it's dangerous. I, I try to avoid um, crossing the street there at Solano, and I would only go the opposite direction towards Ventura or Humboldt um, and just avoid those areas. Um, as somebody else mentioned, uh, that, that close to Solano Avenue and Humboldt and uh, between Ventura, there's often uh, a, just a large number of vans, trucks, work trucks um, parked in that area. And I'm literally taking my life into my own hands, just backing out of my driveway. It's it's that bad. I, I I've gotten nearly hit multiple times. Um, on that same corner of Ventura and Solano Avenue, I I was just in the in my front yard doing some gardening, and I witnessed a hit and run accident with a, a poor group of a uh, car full of young girls, uh, with a large white SUV that just hit and run and took off in the neighborhood. Um, and that was just like a month, a month and a half ago, um, you know, right in front of my, you know, one of the neighbors that I heard here on um, their house. Um, so the, the, the neighborhood really could use some traffic calming program. I, I, I wouldn't be so bold to, as to prescribe what that would be. I'd definitely refer to the experts within public works, but you know, the, the key message here is uh, you've heard from many, many of us in the neighborhood and you know, we're just asking for the funding for those public works people to do their jobs and, and literally anything is better than nothing at all at this point, um, in my opinion. Um, I think that that's all I have to say. I, I, I too, I'm, I'm within earshot of the, the exit there and the donuts, you know, uh, all hours of the day and night, um, uh, because they can quickly get off the interstate, do their donuts and get right back on the interstate. They, it's without, you know, impunity. Um, and it's very scary and, and very loud too. So anyways, that's all I've got to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, John, for your comment. We appreciate it. All right, our next uh, Zoom caller is Lisa B. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello, my name is Lisa and I live near um, Solano and Ventura. Um, I wanted to just speak up and talk about, you know, we live very close to the highway and rarely am I woken up by highway noise. It's 
the sideshows, the speeding, the donuts, all of that um, frequently wakes me up at night. In addition to that, I often hear fireworks go along with this, which puts our entire neighborhood at a danger for fires. Um, and then there is additionally the pedestrians crossing the street and that issue. As such, I would really just like to speak up and advocate for funding for dedicated members within public works to address traffic calming. I'd like to advocate for crosswalks on every intersection of Solano, uh, solar lighted pedestrian notification and speed bumps or anything else. I appreciate everyone's time and listening and that's all from me. Well, thank you, Lisa, for asking, uh, telling us your comment. All right, we have two more and our next uh, person is Edna Ferdinand. Okay, go ahead and ask your question to the finance staff. Yes, good evening. Um, are you able to hear me? Um, yes, yes. Hear me? Hear okay, you. perfect. <clears throat> I'm sure Mr. Chavaria will Remember my name, I have been a one-man band for McBride Avenue. Um, I own an apartment building at 5312 McBride Avenue, directly off the I-80 West McBride Avenue exit. I am um, trying to understand some of the funding um, that was approved um, for my specific area uh, in addition to the project for the McBride Avenue, uh, which I was directly involved with. Um, uh, if for you, for those of you who are not familiar, um, my building um, encompasses DOT, Caltran, and the city of Richmond because it's directly off a of freeway. So this, this means that any work that is to be approved or done has to be a collaborative event which I was unaware of when purchasing it and kind of long, uh, learned the hard way with, you know, things happening and me wondering why nothing was happening to um, address the issues that I was seeing. Uh, I was able to, on my own, have traffic calming with the lighting, uh, the, the street lamps or the, um, the stop signs and all of that just for this little uh, area because it's a, it's a unique four-way stop in which there's blind spots either way that you're um, stopping either on Humboldt or when people are coming from Solano uh, or, excuse me, Amador, um, you can't see the people coming off the freeway. So not only was I a witness to many tragic accidents, I also was a victim three separate times where cars ran into my building and I have a 10-foot steel um, automatic operating gate that I had to repair and replace uh, twice. Um, the last one was um, due to a city, uh, a, a Richmond City police chase, which ended up in my building. So as you can probably understand, um, I'm very, uh, uh, my safety awareness is very high. My situational awareness is very high because I am around the corner from Riverside. I'm a, co a main corridor for the Wildcat Canyon uh, biking and the walking um, of pedestrians and vehicles. Um, I was in constant contact with Tafik Halabi, who was the past uh, senior engineering, uh, um, um, senior engineer for the city of Richmond. And with the help of the D Department of Transportation and Caltrans, there was an approved um, uh, site uh, up, excuse me, let me let me say it correctly. There were improvements that were um, approved uh, collaboratively with uh, the DOT Caltrans and the city of Richmond. So Caltrans immediately changed the off ramp. So for instance, Prior to, to me being able to have this cohesive um, unit, when you get onto the, um, or you're exiting the McBride Avenue ramp, it doesn't, it wouldn't turn uh, red. It would actually turn, you know, um, yellow, and then it would be like a slow red. And for whatever reason, the other light was, was the timing was off. So in essence, there would be a yellow light and a green light for the people coming from 
uh, Amador towards San Pablo. So that's why there were so many accidents. So now when you hit the McBride Avenue exit, it immediately turns the light red. So I don't care how fast you go, by the time you get to the middle of the exit, because it's a long exit, the light will turn red. I also was able to get raised pedestrian um, paint uh, for the many people who go back and forth up McBride Avenue. So when you're exiting the McBride Avenue exit, that initial pedestrian walk was raised with, and also there were white stripes that were um, placed there. In addition to, they put signage saying no, you know, no turn on red, which was not there. And the city of Richmond was able to um, provide pedestrian uh, guardrails because on uh, my side, of course, you can't cross the street, but on the Humboldt and McBride side, you can. So they put signs on either side for me. So for the people coming from Humboldt going towards McBride, they see a sign. For the people exiting McBride Avenue, they see a sign. Um, I also was able to get um, um, the information for the city of Richmond is supposed to report accidents uh, to Caltrans, which also assists with any budgetary um, gains that they may have. So if they say, okay, this is a problem area because the city of Richmond has been providing us with the data to, you know, inform us that this is a problem area. According to Caltrans and the Department of Transportation, there's been no such information being provided. Somehow it stopped. Um, with no regard to providing this information, it put this area in a um, in a uh, position to not be able to get the funding that could be shared with Caltrans and the city of Richmond. So once the city of Richmond received the um, inspection report from Caltrans and the Department of Transportation, there were some recommendations that were made. Caltrans completed every single recommendation that they were responsible for, and so did the Department of Transportation. The city of Richmond, um, per Tafi Halaby, who was the um, person in charge at the time, um, they approved the recommendations as well. Um, and one of them was a slurry seal asphalt that was supposed to be in front of my building because I guess when you're getting off the freeway, there has to be a special type of asphalt. It can't be the regular one. In addition, I was told about the bike lanes that were going to be added, um, and they were going to do single lanes for, um, you know, going up towards Wildcat Canyon and back down to San Pablo. Um, in addition to, they were going to repave all of this. One of the reasons that they couldn't do it at that time was because East Bay Mud was doing a pipeline project, which was going to install new water uh water mains, and they didn't want to, of course, start a project, and then East Bay Mud has to dig. So the goal and the um, the um, items were tagged to be started following the East Bay Mud pipeline project, which was in, um, I was told it was approved in 2020, and um, it was Joe Leach, uh, let's see here, Tafik Halabi, um, Robert Chelamitos and Robin uh, Chi. And all of these people, I believe, are no longer there. So somehow, some way, this project, the, the ball was dropped. And my concern is this was a recommended safety initiative that was approved by not only the city of Richmond, but by the Department of Transportation and Caltrans as a collaborative safety that that needs a collaborative safety um, project that was going to be addressed once the pipeline was completed. The pipeline was completed over six months ago. Nothing's been done. And then when I sent an email, I believe it was to you, Mr. Chavaria, I was um, told it was it was there was no funding. So as as um, once again, as a as a person who doesn't like 
you know, no for an answer. I went to one of the Richmond Heights Council meetings, found out that it was due to a lack of funds and that we were going to write a grant. And I provided all of my data for this grant that I was told was approved. So now I'm hearing that it's going to be delayed even further, which is unacceptable. When 2020, it was approved. This is 2024. Now we're talking 2026, 27. So it's it's unacceptable because this was considered uh, a, a priority and it was approved you know, collectively, and if you know my area, when you hit McBride Light from San Pablo Avenue, and when you pass Humboldt, there's like a there's excuse like me. Upward, mm -hmm. Hello. Yes, yeah. uh, we we're sorry to interrupt, but we do have another caller mm -hmm. allowed to speak, and it sounds like you we understand your concern. There are public works directors here; they will follow up with you. We did. Um, put the slide up for the traffic calming program, and we do understand the nature of your property. There's a collaborative between multiple agencies. So our public works director, Daniel Chivaria, is present, as well as our capital improvement projects manager, and they will be in touch with you. But for the sake of um, the evening meeting and um, other callers who would like to speak, we uh, unfortunately, we do have to interject this time. Um, but we appreciate your, your comments and your concerns, and we'll be in touch with you from our public works director. Um, Robert, you can you put the to be in touch with me or no? If you go to our website, we have a slide up right now to the city of Richmond's website, go to departments, public works, and from that tab, you can select traffic calming projects. You can enter your information and then we'll be in touch with you. But we appreciate okay. your, your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Richard, next right. caller, please. Okay, our final caller is Dawa Ihatso. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, can you hear it. me? There it goes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I live on uh, Ventura, uh, 722 Ventura, a uh, neighbor of Heather, who just spoke. And, you know, I totally agree and support Heather's uh, proposed project on traffic calming. Um, you know, I take my daughter, I have two daughters, uh, five and a half and 11. We walk uh, every night. And once what happened, I was walking with my daughter who's five and a half year. We were walking and suddenly she slipped on the street and there was a car coming by so fast. It almost ran over my daughter. They never stopped. Uh, so what I mean is like, you know, people uh, who live around this area would really appreciate it if city could process and uh, support uh, with enough funding to get more workers and uh, finish off this project as soon as possible. Um, and I totally support uh, Heather's uh, proposed project. That's about it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do have one comment on the Q&A. And I'm trying to turn this off right here. Um, is from Gabriella. She her question is question regarding the traffic calming program website. Does each neighbor need to submit a request, or can on request with neighbors signatures be submitted? It's to this. It's whatever their preference is. They could submit them individually or collectively. Um, it the information will go through, and Public Works will be in touch whatever their preference is. But we thank you, Richard, for facilitating the online callers. We thank you to all the callers, both online as well as in person, who came and attended. Um, we uh, do want to, again, acknowledge Daniel Chavarria, our Public Works Director, uh, as well as other Public Works staff who are present, and they will be in touch regarding the Solano Avenue traffic calming projects. Um, but at this point in time, um, we are going to hit and conclude the meeting. Thank you. If it's on the traffic calming project, if you could be in touch with Daniel Chavarria, so he'll answer your questions. <laughs>